Hi folks, welcome to Changing Minds. My name is Joe Devlin and I'm the host. I often describe the show as um, using psychology and neuroscience to better understand human behavior. And up till now, the focus has primarily been on the psychology side of things. Today, we're gonna to switch that around a little bit and talk about some of the neuroscience, and I'm very excited by that. Today's guest is Professor Kate Jeffrey, uh, who is the head of the, the Institute of Behavioral Neuroscience. And um, Kate is also originally a Kiwi. She's from New Zealand. And in fact, was in New Zealand when lockdown happened. So she was doing some work and she was visiting her family. And as a result, she is still in New Zealand. So given the uh, 11 hour time difference, we had the opportunity to record our conversation a little bit earlier. So I'm gonna play the recording for you today. And unfortunately it means we can't take any live questions because it's three in the morning for poor Kate and she is not awake enough to answer at the moment. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is share my screen, share this conversation that Kate and I had and uh, get going. Hi Kate, welcome to Changing Minds. Thank you very much, I'm pleased to be here. I'm really pleased you could join me today, thanks a lot. I guess I'd like to start by asking you what is behavioral neuroscience and how did you get involved with it? Ah, well, behavioral neuroscience generally is the um, discipline that's trying to understand um, behavior, human behavior and, and other animal behavior in terms of the brain and uh, brain circuits and brain function, you know, all of that type of stuff. So to bring together these two disciplines that historically have been quite far apart. And, to, to, um, and I got interested in it when I was a, um, a medical student, actually, in third year, we had to do um, a, an options sort of course. Um, and we could do a research project on anything that we wanted to do with behavioral science. And um, I started reading up about the brain and information processing and learning about information theory. And, um, and during that time, I sort of started doing some reading about historical ideas of brain function and how it might generate behavior. And I just thought, this is super cool. I don't want to be a doctor. <laughs> I want to understand how the brain works. So, so I went to visit John O'Keefe while I was there. And I was, it was in my punk phase and I had, I had short spiky orange hair and Doc Martin bobber boots. I don't, I don't know what on earth Crazy. he thought of me. Actually, my hair is at the moment short and spiky and, and, and semi-orange. So then we've come around full circle. But anyway, I, I, um, I went and visited John and he told me that he discovered these things called place cells. And I sort of thought, oh, yeah, sounds interesting. <laughs> Went away, didn't think anything more about it. <laughs> and while I was in the UK um, studying the hippocampus and LTP, I had the opportunity to visit John O'Keefe again. And this time I knew a lot more about place cells. And I am starting to understand what an important discovery they were. And, I, and he showed me some. And I had the opportunity to collect some data from some. And I just thought, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I want to study these. So after my PhD, I went to work with John and um, the rest is history. Fantastic. Now this is John O'Keefe, the Nobel laureate for discovering right. place cells, yeah. is that right? That's right, yes. Yeah. So I've had the so, pleasure of meeting John. I mean, he's an extraordinary man and I can imagine how compelling that would be. But one of the things I heard, and maybe you can tell me if this is true, is that um, initially a lot of his work wasn't really believed, like this, this fabulous discoveries that he had for years, he struggled to get people to sort of buy into it. Is that true? So he had just come to UCL at that point to set up a new lab. He was quite a young um, lecturer at that point. And he um, took this technique and ran with it, basically. And the first thing he did was to try recording from hippocampus. And he discovered that if you're um, observing the activity, so listening, typically, to, to the activity of a single neuron, you find that it becomes active whenever the animal goes to a particular place in the environment. So it's walking around this box, foraging for rice or whatever you're giving it, just, just minding its own business, not thinking about too much. You know. um, but every time it goes into this corner of the box, suddenly one of these neurons becomes really, really excited and it, it fires lots and lots and lots of nerve impulses. And then the, the animal walks off and does something else and that neuron stops. And then maybe another one starts up. And he sort of worked out that these neurons, um, you know, that most of the neurons that you would record from that region had a place in the environment that they would become active in. And so he proposed that these are forming a kind of a, an internal map of space. Um, and that idea just didn't fit with the switch, telephone switchboard idea because it, it supposed that there was a map, you know, of some sort in, in the brain, some kind of 
um, what what people would deridingly call a black box, you know, of, of, of with a rep internal representation that wasn't visible to the outside world, but it was in there, and, and that just didn't fit with the behaviorist, um, purely associative paradigm. So yeah, people were a bit skeptical, and and, um, and to be fair, the technology of the time was also quite primitive. So um, there were only a handful of cells in that very first paper, and um, the way that we showed cell activity in those days was to just show them as a function of time. So you'd have a graph of time uh, with the activity of the cell, and then there would be written, you know, rat in southwest corner of box here, or rat, in, you know, um, over corner here, or rat rearing here. So, so it wasn't really compelling data. Um, so for that reason, people, you know, weren't um, immediately seized by it. But then other people started to record here as well, and they found the same thing. And um, as years went by, more and more evidence came along to support that these really were a thing. Mm. And a lot of the criticisms that were leveled at it, like, you know, this is just, it's a sensory cell and it's responding to this splotch that the rats made of urine on the floor or something, something like that. These are just sensory cells. A lot of those criticisms were, um, Kind of removed with control experiments and, and this that, and the other. So it took a it took quite a few years, um, but eventually it became in, incontrovertible that this was a spatial system um, that was um, nevertheless intimately linked with memory. So the memory idea is still alive and kicking. That's those are the things I wanted to bring up on that. I mean, because at some level it seems incredibly impressive given those kind of limits that he actually was still able to recognize what was in front of him, this idea that there's an internal map. But I was just saying, thinking as you were saying this, that it doesn't obviously fit with memory, right? Like, it, how does the spatial layout of a map relate to the fact that we're able to remember things or not? Yes, that's, that's something that um, has been um, a hot topic of discussion for several decades now. Um, because, you know, the, the, the reason that the hippocampus was associated with memory is that people with damage to the hippocampus are profoundly amnesic. So they, they can't lay down new memories of things that have happened to them. And the classic case of this was the case of HM, which every psychology student learns about in first year, um, who had surgery um, to, to try and cure his epilepsy. So the hippocampus is often a focus for epilepsy, and that's why that was going to be my original master's project, to, to look at mechanisms of epilepsy. Um, so he had the hippocampus on both sides of the brain removed, to, because he had a, turned out he had an epileptic focus on both sides of the uh, hippocampus, which is unusual. Um, and then he woke up from his surgery, and his epilepsy was much better, but his memory was profoundly impaired. So um, and then putting that together with other clinical findings, it, it was becoming obvious that people with hippocampal damage couldn't form new memories. But um, Brenda Milner, who was the neuropsychologist who first studied HM really carefully, showed that uh, there are some kinds of memory that are preserved, actually, mm. um, even in people with hippocampal damage. So they, uh, they can learn new motor skills. So a motor skill would be something like playing tennis or driving a car or something like that. Something that you, you feel like your body is taken care of but you don't have to think about too much. Um, so there are a few kinds of information that um, the hippocampus isn't needed to store, but memory for life events does require a hippocampus. And so when the evidence for the spatial um, map came along, the question is, well, how do you reconcile these two things? And the, the obvious link is one that we've known about for thousands of years, actually, which is that um, we often use space as an organizing framework for our memories. Right, these memories, so, right? That, that's right. So you, so you can do it, you can do it with training. So um, if you want to remember large amounts of information, the best way to do that is to create a mental map and then to associate that information with places in your mental map. So the memory palace is an example of that. So you, you imagine this incredible building that's sort of ornately decorated. And, um, you've got things that you want to remember, which might be elements of a speech or something. And as you're walk, mentally walking through this palace, you think, okay, that's where I put the reference to my father, and this is where I put the reference to my uncle, and blah, 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 blah. Um, but even um, in a less structured way, we know from everyday experience that like, you go back to a place you've not been in for a long time, and suddenly you get flooded with trivial memories of things you've completely forgotten. Oh, that's right. The last time I was in this restaurant, um, that way to drop that wine glass and made that terrible mess. You know, it's really trivial things, which you would have thought had just gone get retrieved 
by um, reconstructing the spatial um, context of, of the event. Um, so that happens when you're moving around the real world. And, and I think now I'm starting to think that also happens when you mentally move around space. So when you retrieve a memory, often what you will do is you will mentally reconstruct the place where you were when the memory happened. Like if somebody says, who was at your wedding? Probably the thing you would do is mentally picture your wedding with yourself in it and think, now who are the, who are the people there? So, so actually it turns out that space and memory um, are very interlinked. Are there, are there groups like architects and people who are uh, designing spatial layouts essentially that are interested in this kind of material? Do they use any of the insights? So there are certainly, um, there's a lot of interest in um, the experience of space. So this is something that I've become quite interested in as, as architecture, because of course, architects are designing space. Right. And so the cognitive psychology and the cognitive neuroscience of space is very relevant. But up until now, there's been very little crosstalk between these two disciplines. So architects, by and large, um, have worked on a, um, a more sort of experiential level. So they create spaces and then they look at how people um, have responded to those in a relatively informal way. So they don't, they don't approach this the way a cognitive psychologist would with you know, lots of subjects and controls and all, all of that kind of stuff. So, so it's a lot more um, qualitative. Whereas um, cognitive psychologists, you know, the spaces that they study are a lot more boring. <laughs> but on the other hand, the, the, the um, study is a, is a lot more controlled. So you, the data, you can start to, to actually draw some more scientific conclusions. So, um, so people like me, there's a few of us now who are starting to think it's time that these two disciplines actually got together. Um, and so I've become quite interested in, in trying to um, get some, some cross-talk going. In fact, one of the reasons that I'm in New Zealand right now is that I came to work with um, a colleague called David Bilkey, who is also somebody interested in place cells, but is also interested in architecture. Mm. And we got talking and said, wouldn't it be um, cool to, to um, use virtual reality to create um, some architectural spaces that we can then study as a cognitive psychologist would? Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd never done any sort of virtual reality in design before. And, and so I thought this sounds like a good opportunity to get some new skills. And so I've come over here and um, have been learning to create environments. So very, very simple environments. And we have a headset that lets you kind of walk around. And as you walk around, you feel like you're walking around this whole other universe. It's, it's really an amazing experience. And um, so the plan is to try and get um, some simple experiments going to look at navigation. And the idea is to try and develop some general principles of architecture. So architects obviously want to maintain the aesthetic component of what they do. They want their buildings to be beautiful. But at the same time, um, a lot of the buildings need to be functional. So if you're designing a train station, for example, or a conference center or something like that, you know, that is a net or a hospital, something that's a navigational challenge for people. If it's possible to, to use the structure of the building to help people navigate, um, that reduces the need to use signage, which can be really confusing or hard to see, or maybe you don't read the language and, and so on and so forth. So, um, so we would really like to develop some, some principles of uh, building design <clears throat> that can help the human brain to navigate in a way that's not at odds with the, with, with the aesthetics of it. So that, that's the basic idea. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and, you know, earlier you had mentioned something about sort of um, rats and kind of a square space. And of course, I would imagine that symmetry has got to be awful, right? I mean, if you can't tell north, south, east or west, um, that's got to be tricky for anybody to navigate. You need signage then, right? Is that one of those kind of principles? Yes, it, it is. So, so our built spaces do tend to be symmetrical. So, um, Sometimes they're square, so that has a fourfold symmetry, which if you're just in a perfectly square room with nothing else in it, you wouldn't know which way you were facing necessarily. Um, but a lot of our buildings are at least rectangular, which has a twofold symmetry, so you don't know whether you're going this way or this way. Right. Um, and the other, the other problem is that if you, um, if you go around a corner from a space, um, from one space to another space, and there isn't a visual continuity between those spaces. So let's say you had to go through a doorway or something like that. Um, and our walls are opaque because mostly our walls are opaque. So you can't see each compartment from the other compartment. You're just in a room and now you're in another room. So, so you have to remember the turn that you made. Like you have to have processed 
that you turn 90 degrees and you have to remember that you have to remember now I'm facing 90 degrees from where I was yeah. and that turns out to be something that's very easily disrupted so um, if you were talking as you went around the corner or you were on your phone or um, you went around a staircase or something like that and didn't, didn't track all the turns properly then you end up <clears throat> with it sort of being misoriented. And, and so you, you haven't correctly stored how those two spaces are connected. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's a, that's a real problem. And I think that um, one thing that we need to think about is how to make that easier for people so, so that they can uh, stitch together the sub-compartments and the complex building that, that they're trying. And there are various ways you can do that. So for example, you can have an, an atrium in the middle where every room has a glass wall onto the atrium. So wherever you are, you've got this constant reference point. And so buildings that work well tend to have features like that, that, that break the symmetry for you so that you don't have to rely on your memory at any point to be able to reorient and know which way around you're facing. Yeah. And the other thing you can do is just make the building not rectangular. You, so you can put a curve in it or something like that. So you can, you can distinguish facing this way from facing this way by which way the curve goes you know there are various things that you could do if you knew that that was important for orientation yeah it makes a ton of sense what about things like laying out a shop floor right i mean because again this is a situation where people have to navigate a space but how they navigate a space is presumably important for how they you know find things that they're looking for like in a grocery store or a, a pharmacy um it, are people looking at how these how the neuroscience of of navigation can be useful in, in things like shop floor design? I think, yeah, I think the, the neuroscience of navigation um, has a lot to say about that. But this is one of these interesting situations where um, often the intent of the um, building owner <clears throat> is, is sort of at odds with the intent of the brain. So the, the brain wants to be efficient in its navigation. You want to get from place A to place B. You know? Whereas, um, if you if you own a supermarket, you want your customer to pass every product in the store <laughs> because you want them to see things and go, oh, that looks nice. I'll, I'll, I'll get some of that. You know, you want them to do things that that they hadn't known that they were going to do. You know, to um, discover things they didn't even know existed, and so on, and so on. So, in some ways, you want to thwart the navigation system and make make it hard for people to navigate so that they're forced on a route. And now that I know that this is a strategy, it it drives me crazy you know I, and I'm um, in an airport and I'm late and I'm rushing to the gate and I'm forced on the circuitous route through the duty-free or something like that I, I, I get extremely frustrated so there's a balance to be found between um, having people navigate inefficiently um, but not making them frustrated and angry and uh, one of my favorite examples of this is uh, Ikea which that's um, what I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's famous for both being extremely difficult to navigate and also making people angry, you know, by the time exactly. they get to the checkout. <laughs> but it's very effective. You know, they, they sell huge amounts of stuff. And, um, and often I think a lot of their sales are the bit at the end when you're going through all of the, um, the small produce. You've been past all the furniture and the, the large stuff, which is probably what you came for but they make you go through all of the small stuff and you, you look at that and you're like, oh, I'd like some of that. And, oh, oh, that looks cute. I'll get, you know. And you, you end up laden with, with stuff. So it's very effective. Um, so yeah, that, so, so you can exploit um, knowledge of human psychology um, to different ends, depending on your own. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes, that makes a ton of sense. Um, and look, this has been absolutely fascinating. And it's clear we can keep going forever, but I'm sensitive to the fact that um, you know, we probably need to wrap up just for time purposes. Um, thank you so much, Kate. I really found it exciting and fascinating materials. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on the show. Okay. Um, so that wraps up my conversation with Kate. I'm sorry that she's not here to be able to take live questions, but um, I would like to thank my guest, Professor Kate Jeffries, very much for, for taking the time out of her schedule to do this. Um, next week, we're back live and we're going to be talking with Professor Sarah Garfinkel um, about your gut feelings and why being able to hear what your body is actually telling you can be such an important aspect of navigating your environment, navigating your world and dealing with other people in particular. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you all very much and goodbye.